backsliding? I think I saw him drink. Yeah, but in moderation. I just wasn't seeing much fruit. Yeah, he's going down a slippery slope. How's your heart, man? How's your heart? I'm just such a words guy. It was a total God thing. I'm blessed. I've been working on my testimony. Is that secular music? We're opening with a secular song tonight. Wait, is this a secular song? Isn't she secular? Which station's the fish? 104.3, the fish. Safe for the whole family. Christians say some weird stuff, right? I mean, we if you think examine some of the words we say, like, uh, you know, the, one of the next video clips will be thought life. Like, who really says thought life? Have you used that in normal conversation? Probably not. We say words like evangelism. Uh, what? Discipleship. Uh, we talk about these things all the time. And what this series is going to try to do is examine those words break them down so that they make sense. We just say too many, th we, we say weird stuff. Like, hey, we, when, you, when you trust in Jesus, what, what? what? I'm trusting in, I'm, I'm saved? What is, saved from what, what? We say all kinds of words, and this series is gonna be about trying to explain those to make, help it make sense so that people can, under, so that people can understand the goodness of Jesus. Um, there's another one, goodness, like what? I don't know. Today we're gonna talk about the word gospel. Let's say the word together. Let's say gospel. Very, one more, try one more time, y'all. One, two, three. Gospel. Very good. Uh, what, what this word means in its, like, the very broadest of terms is it means good news. It means good news. So I'm a, I'm a Detroit Lions fan. We had the NFL draft. So what we did, uh, the NFL draft is the Detroit Lions Super Bowl. The, the, this, this is what we live for every year. Which wide receiver are we going to pick in the first round again? That's a, that's a joke because the Lions like to pick wide receiver in the first round that end up in jail. Um, that, that's a thing that they do frequently, and they are, thankfully, this year we got a new general manager. This new general manager used to work for the Patriots, uh, so you may hate Bill Belichick, but that guy knows how to draft people. And, and this guy, and our new guy, Bob Quinn, I think his name, drafted some offensive linemen, some defensive linemen, and to a Detroit Lions fan, a long-suffering Detroit Lions fan, our superstars retire early, Barry Sanders, Calvin Johnson, to a longtime Lions fan, that was good news. Uh, I've been traveling a lot lately, so I went to... Uh, I was just came back from Orlando this last week, and I was uh, in Dallas earlier in April, and uh, again in Dallas in, in March, and doing just fundraising stuff for the church as we're trying to buy property. And uh, came, I was talking to Blaze on the phone uh, this last week. Blaze is my middle son, and and I said, Blaze, I'm going to come home tomorrow, and he said, Oh, Daddy, that is good news, which is like heart melting, right? It's like, oh, he's so sweet. And then I said, well, why are you, why are you excited? Be because mom doesn't give me ice cream. <laughs> okay, all right, good enough. I'll take it, right? Uh, the word good news, the word gospel, was actually used uh, in ancient times. So it, it translates this Greek word, euangelium. And it, that word was used of a, of a Greek king who would go out to battle. And when they would go out to battle or go out to war, either defending their city, defending their, their territory, or going to take another territory, after a victory, they would send someone called a gospel carrier. And this gospel carrier, it was their job, only their job, to run back and to share loud and proud that they won. So they would go to the city walls and they would start declaring we won, we won, we're free, we won. And they would go all over the city declaring, we won, we won, we won, we won, we're free, we won. And their job, their biggest job, was to declare the victory that they have. When we talk about the gospel, we get to declare the victory that we have in Jesus. We get to declare that there is hope and excitement and, and possibility, and that there is victory and freedom in who he is. So I want to take you through the word gospel, and we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15. So if you, if you have your Bibles, that's where we'll be. 1 Corinthians 15 is, is uh, in the New Testament, and we're going to walk through about seven verses today, and we're going to explain 
uh, carefully the gospel from this passage. So we're, we're just going to take a few words at a time and, and go through this, all right? And then later, we're going to celebrate the good news of the gospel with, our, with the table. With, this is called the Lord's Supper or communion or uh, the Eucharist or whatever you want to call it. We'll explain that as we get to it, but that's coming as well. So first things first, we're going to read the passage. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, it goes like this. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. Good news. I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word, I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That's good news right there. Verse 4, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that his name is also Peter, then to the twelve. Then he also appeared more than 500, to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. That's a really nice way to say dead. Um, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Verse 8. Last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I'm the least of the apostles. This is Paul talking. And this may not be on the screen. I didn't give him this. I just wanted to give you this. For I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Or then it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. Will you pray with me? I just want to pray. Father God, thank you for your word that we get to read. Thank you for the gospel that we get to soak in. Lord, I pray that it would be joyful, heart-exalting as we think, talk, meditate, on the good news that we have in your son. Lord, let, let our hearts rest in who you are and what you've done. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So what we're going to work through today is about six points, and then we're going to have a definition of gospel at the end. Remember, the big idea of gospel is good news. But we want to talk through what is it all about. So look at, look at, me, look at verse 3. It says this, for I delivered to you, this is Paul talking, so it's the guy who wrote most of the New Testament. He says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. So number one, write this down. The gospel is the most important thing. When we get down to it and we start talking about the gospel, what we have to understand, we have to grab from it is that it is literally the most important thing. That's what Paul wanted them to get from the very beginning. Hey, Corinthian church. Now this Corinthian church, they were a mess. They had all kinds of things going on. Like, they would have communion. And when they had communion, people would be getting drunk while they are having communion. Now, that's not a dangerous for us. We have grape juice just in case. Uh, it's over here. You're probably not going to get drunk. Probably. Uh, I was on the truck for a, a little while in the, in the bottle. So, but it's going to be good. It's fine. It's fresh. I had some this morning. I'm feeling okay, mostly. This Corinthian church was a mess. They had a guy who was sleeping with his father's wife. And they, and they said, we are, we, you know, we're just proud of ourselves because we accept them so well. This place was a mess. They would get up in the middle of church like this. Let's say worship happened right here. And somebody over here would start, would start speaking in tongues, and then someone over there would start doing something, and it would be all over. And their, and their church services would last for probably hours and hours and hours, and they would not be going along with what the scripture had to say about it. They, would have, they had this, these divisions all throughout the church where uh, one person would say, I'm a follower of Apollos, who was a preacher at the time. I'm a follower of Paul. I'm a follower of Peter. And then the really pious ones, the people who thought they were the most holy of holy ones, they, they would say, I follow Jesus. And they were all just fighting one against another. The church was a mess. And so what Paul's trying to do with this church is to say, hey, forget all of that other stuff. Let's get down to the thing that matters most. And the thing that matters most is the gospel. That there is literally nothing else that matters more than that, really for anybody, but especially for the Christian. 
that there isn't anything else that matters this much. Nothing else matters as much as what Jesus has done. Nothing else is as important. So, hey, Corinthian church, you're a mess. You are so screwed up. Hey, any church, there's mess all over. Let's get down to what's most important. Let's get down to what matters the most. So, Christian, understand today. The most important thing for you, the most important thing for me, is the gospel person who is here today who does not know the gospel, who's never trusted in Jesus, who's never been saved, who's never used all whatever word we use for that, understand something. There is nothing more important for you today than to understand the gospel. That's what we want to work through today. So number two, look at this. Verse three goes like this. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in according to the scriptures. Have you ever, so, so you hear the word, you hear the name Jesus Christ, okay? Now, I'll admit, when I was a kid, I thought that Christ was his last name. Anybody else there? Anybody, like, yeah, maybe you think it right, you're like, wait, it's not his last name? <laughs> hold, hold on a second. This is, rev- maybe, maybe that's true. Like, a lot of people, you read the Bible, and it just sounds like, you know, Jesus Christ, okay. His father's name was Joseph Christ, and his mother's <laughs> name was Mary Christ, and that, you know, that's just the way it is. And John the Baptist, well, his, uh, his middle name is The, and his last name is Baptist, right? The whole family has weird names. The word Christ uh, is actually, it, it's Greek, and it means anointed. And what it is, is it's the Greek, it, it's the Greek translation or transliteration of the Old Testament word for this, which was Messiah. And the Messiah was the anointed one. So anointed to do something. So what they would do in Old Testament times is a king would be anointed or a prophet would be anointed. And this was was special to say this person holds a very distinct office. And what's told all throughout the Old Testament is that there is one to come who is the Messiah, the Messiah, not just a king, not just the king who, who's going to be in charge for a while, not just a prophet or the prophet who's going to share some things. No, this is the king. This is the Messiah. This is, this is the one. Well, why did that start? Where did that come from? Genesis 1. Genesis 1, God creates, right? Remember Genesis 1? It makes everything, and everything is good. Genesis 2, that's when uh, they're in the garden, and, and there's this snake that starts talking. That's problematic. The snake starts talking to Eve. Eve takes the fruit. Eve eats the fruit. Eve gives it to her husband, Adam, who's like, all right, I'll eat that. And, and then what happens is sin enters into the world. And in Genesis 3, God comes down, and there's this, this reckoning moment of, hey, Adam, what did you do? And Adam, you know, does what all men do. He blames his wife. And, and then Eve, what did you do? And blames the serpent. And then God goes in on the serpent and says, hey, serpent, and this is Satan, says, hey, one day there will be one who comes. And this one who comes is the anointed one, this one who comes is going to be bruised on the heel by you. Bruised heel, that hurts, right? Hard to walk. You ever bruise your heel? Anybody? Uh, My son has a blood blister on his heel right now, freaks out if he sees it. It doesn't hurt him at all, but he's just, whatever, freaks out. You get a bruise on your heel, it's hard to walk, right? Kind of painful. He says, but what this one who's to come is going to do He's going to crush your head. This is a death blow. So this, this one to come is foretold of throughout the Old Testament. And he's called the anointed one, the Messiah. David lifts him up and God says that he will have this throne forever and ever. This is the anointed one. And then 
Matthew starts in and Mark and Luke and John tell the story of the anointed one who has come and who lives a perfect life and who dies on a cross and, and, and tells the story of who Jesus is and what he's done. And the whole thing that we have to understand is that the gospel isn't initiated by you or me. A lot of times we, we, we'll say, hey, and we'll probably do it at the end of this service. We say, if you want to believe, let us know. We want to pray with you. You want to believe in Jesus? Come talk to us. We, we want to talk you through what that means, what that decision is all about. And so we get into this idea that somehow we initiate the gospel. But we don't. Because God initiated it back here after Adam and Eve sinned. He started the process. And he started the whole thing, and then what he does is he speaks into your heart that when you are struggling, that, that, that when you come to the end of yourself and you find that your heart is sinful and you're in need of a Savior, that he initiates that too. And so number two, if you're taking notes, is that God initiates the gospel. God initiates this thing. It wasn't, it wasn't some shock to him that, that, that when sin entered the world, what, what to do? He had the plan from, from eternity past that his son was going to come. And he's going to die for the sins of mankind. God initiates the gospel. Both overall, in the, in the here's a big word, in the big meta-narrative of it all. In the way the whole story is laid out but he also initiates it inside of your heart. That was an intense sneeze. <laughs> God initiates the gospel. Number three. Verse three again. Isn't this cool? We're just going to talk about it again. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our, what's the word? Sins. In accordance with the scripture. Hey, we broke it down just a second ago. Genesis 3, where Genesis 2, where sin enters in, and Genesis 3, where God answers what, what's going on with sin. And sin devastates. We don't really think about it that much, because what we end up doing is we think about sins as like lies. So, oh, I've lied, and that's bad, or I cheated, and that's bad. And we end up thinking of ourselves as, as the things, we think of sin as the thing that we do. Right? Does that make sense? So we think of a sin as an action that we take that is wrong. Now, that is a sin. That, but what we always say here is that what those actions of sin, what those things are, is symptoms of a deeper problem. What those things are is a symptom of a deeper problem. Uh, so I have intense allergies. Anybody else? If you've moved to Houston, you will develop allergies. There will just be liquid that starts draining from every orifice of your face, right? That's what happens. And it's not, I mean, maybe it's sweat because that happens too. Welcome to the humidity. But it's also what, there's pollen on my car and it is thicker than snow used to be on my car when I lived in Michigan, Right? And, and the thing is, it doesn't come off, no matter how hard you scrub. And so it's just disgusting. Now, the watery eyes, the cough, the, the, the intense nasal congestion, the sinus headache that just won't quit are symptoms. Those are symptoms of a different problem. There are problems still, right? I don't want to sneeze all the time. I don't want to have an itchy throat. I don't want that. Those are symptoms. The issue is my allergy. Pollen, tree, mold, I don't know, grass, everything in Houston, whatever. Think about the flu. You get a temperature. Your temperature is a symptom. Your, uh, your vomit, that's a nice word to say it, right, it is a symptom. Your your overall, like I always explain it as like a sick fog that kind of comes over me when I get something like that. That's a symptom. The issue is the flu that's infected you. When we talk about sin, 
Yeah, we talk about individual things that you do wrong against others or against God. Absolutely. Adultery, lying, murdering, those things. Idolatry, worshiping something that isn't God. Those things are sin, but what they are is just an indication of a further heart sickness. We have to understand that, that this sin causes us to be broken and our entire world to be broken. That there is a brokenness in this world that one day when Christ comes back, when Christ returns, when, when Jesus comes back, the brokenness will be undone. And I love the Jesus Storybook Bible. We read to our kids all the time. And, and, it says, and I love the way they say it, is that the sadness will come untrue. So number three, the gospel is the only answer to our brokenness. The gospel is the only answer to our brokenness. There isn't another answer. You can't medicate your brokenness away. You can't retail therapy your brokenness away. You can't eat your brokenness away. You can't have sex enough to take that brokenness away. You can't earn enough money to take that brokenness away. You can't succeed enough to take that brokenness away. Because at the end of the day, you lay in your bed and it's dark and you know that something's not right. That there is a brokenness. That there is something that isn't right in your soul. That there's a Savior who comes to fix those things. The gospel is the good news that your brokenness doesn't have to be the end of you. That your brokenness isn't all there is to it. But that there is wholeness in the one who is holy. Number four. I love this one. The gospel is centered on a, on a historical event. And yes, it's Anne, not uh. All right, here it is, verse 4. That he was buried, Jesus. That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now, here's the thing. This is a thing that Christians really believe, okay? So, Christian, understand this. You believe that a man died on a cross and that he was put into a tomb, and then three days later, he came out of the tomb, right? That, that sounds crazy, right? If you go, I just had a friend, he just did a funeral up, up, up in the woodlands. And, and you know what? At that funeral, the person they put in the ground, they're not coming back up. Anybody else you put in the ground, they're not coming back up. They're dead. They're dead. The thing about dead people is they typically stay dead. Not this dead person. Christian, you really believe this. But we really believe it for good reason. It's not just, okay, well, I'm just going to step out in faith. Oh, sounds good to me. I'm not going to really think about it. There's actual reason, and it's in the rest of the verse. Look at this. Verse 5. And he appeared to Cephas. That's Peter. So what Jesus does, he comes out of the grave. He raises again, and he, and he appears to Peter. Uh, okay, that was like his, his number one guy. That was, that was like the next in, in command in the disciple group. All right, so Peter hears it. And then to the 12, so the disciples, the apostles, they hear it. So they see, they, they don't just hear it, they see him. Ima just imagine that for a moment. Like, hey, he was our best friend, and I saw him die on a cross in a horrible way, and now he's right in front of me. I think I'm on, I think there was something in the, in the grape juice we had last night. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time okay so here it is peter the 12 then 500 other people do you know what paul's writing this writing this to the corinthians telling them hey there are people and at this time all these people are still alive there are people in this world who saw jesus resurrected and so Paul is telling the Corinthians, if you are struggling to believe this, go talk to them. He's saying, 
there is real historical evidence that this man who died didn't stay dead, but came out of a tomb and walked and lived and then went to heaven. Then he appeared to more than 500 at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Most of these people still alive, not for us. This is He's writing to people in the first century, so it's not like they saw Jesus. Now they're going to live like uh, in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade or whatever forever and ever, and they're drinking out of this cup. <sighs> then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. So he just, Jesus lived, died, rose again. When I teach my kids the gospel, when I sit with them, we, you're always wondering, how much, can I, how much can I help them to understand? I've got a three-year-old, I've got a five-year-old, I've got an eight-year-old. How much can I share with them? How much are they really going to be able to get? So we always start with this thing, this historical event, that, that what we need to understand, what I want my kids to get, is that Jesus is a real person, that he came, that he died, and that he rose again. So if, if you were to ask my kids... Now, you'll go ask them today, and they'll, you know, they'll blank. But if you were to ask my kids, what does Daddy say the gospel is? How does Daddy teach you the gospel? What is the gospel, Drew? What is the gospel, Blaze? What is the gospel, Judd? He's getting there. He's three. Sometimes he's, you know, jumping all over the bed. They would say this, that Jesus came, that Jesus died, and Jesus rose again. This is the heart of what the gospel is. The heart of the gospel is the person and work of Jesus Christ. That he is fully God, that he is fully man, and these two natures were combined perfectly within one person, and this one person went to this earth like the Bible said he was going to come, and that he's going to live perfectly, and that he's going to die on a cross, and he's not going to stay dead, he's going to rise again. So the the Bible, the, the, the Bible reveals the gospel, and the gospel says that Jesus came and Jesus died and Jesus rose again. And this is the core of what you believe, Christian. This is the core. If you do not believe these three things, then you are not a Christian. If you somehow think that Jesus is just some ethereal thought or that, or that, or that he is a good teacher or, 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 that, or that he was, was a good man, but you do not believe that he came, that he died, and that he rose again, you are not a Christian. The person and work of Jesus is, is the very root of the gospel, the foundation of the gospel. It's initiated by God, but Jesus is the, is the central aspect, what he's done, who he is. That's it. Moving on. Look at verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand. The gospel comes and it is preached. That's what we're doing right now. That's what we are striving to do every week at City View is to preach the gospel in here, in your kids' areas, throughout everything we do, the gospel is going to be made much of. We're going to talk about who Jesus is and what he's done all the time. And it's going to come. You're, it's going to be put in front of you. And here's the thing. You must receive it. You must receive it. Now what happens is, what's going on the, theologically is God's working your heart. And, it, and he's, he's showing you your sin. He's showing you you're messed up and that you need something. That you're broken and that you need, you need the gospel. But when the gospel comes to you, when it's placed in front of you, you need to receive it. Does that make sense? That you need to receive this good gift of God to you. That he's put it there and he's placed it there and he says, take this thing, it's here. And what happens when we receive the gospel is we get eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe on him should not perish. I'm, a, I'm an old King James kid. That word perish just means die. 
but have eternal life. What we get in the gospel, in the good news of Jesus, we get eternal life. And, and I don't want to gloss over that and make that sound small because it is gigantic that we are broken and what we deserve as a result of our brokenness and our sin is hell. That's what we deserve in eternal language. But what we get as a result of the good news of Jesus is not that, but heaven. That when we die, we go to heaven. That when our last breath is breathed, our soul is with Jesus forever in heaven. That is truth, and that is good news. We have a hope that's beyond this world. And so that it's not about the thing you're striving for right now. The next promotion. The job. The 20% down payment on the house. The maxing out your Roth IRAs and 401k or 403b contribution. It's not about paying off the house. It's not about paying off the debt. None of those things are bad. But what we live for in this day is not that. We live for what's to come. Believer, live for what's to come. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, Paul says it, Paul, Paul lays it out like this. There's two, there's two places you are. You're either lost or you're found. The Titanic, you, you've probably heard that or at least seen the movie, right? What happened in real life when the Titanic went down is everyone was worried about their loved ones. Where are they? What are they doing? Are they, did they make it or did they not make it? And what they did in London is they put this giant chalkboard up in the, in the city square. And on one side it said lost, and the other one it said saved. And as word came in as to which person, what, what, what was going on with each person, the name got put on the chalkboard as either lost or saved. When it comes down to it, there's only two types of people in this world. You're either lost or you're saved. And what makes the difference is what you do with Jesus. Does that make sense? That what makes the difference is what you do with Jesus. Do you believe the gospel or do you reject the gospel? Jason, I don't want to do either one. I don't, you know, I'm just going to stay neutral. You can't. Staying neutral is saying no. No. Because it has to be received. You have to take it. It's a free gift. Number six. <clears throat> and by, so let me do verse one. And now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand. Verse two. And by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So write this down. The gospel is the way we grow. The gospel is the way we grow. We grow through the gospel. This is how we as believers live and breathe. Hey, I grew up in a church, a wonderful church. I loved my church. I still talk to my old pa my pastor today. We actually launched City View, I think, 60 years to the day that he launched his church. It was, it was crazy when, I, when we found that out. I love that man, Dr. Donald Gregory, sweet man. He called. The reason I post birthdays on Facebook every, if, you, uh, if you're in our Facebook group and your birthday comes up, I post your birthday in Facebook just to say happy birthday. I got that from him. They didn't have Facebook in 1940, whatever. I don't know if you knew that or not. But he has, since that day, since 1940, whatever, 
he called every member in his church on their birthday. And, it, it, you know, and the church grew. It was like 800, 900 people at one point. And, and he's calling all these people all the time because he loved his people. I love that man. I, I love him. And that's where I received the gospel. That's where I was saved. But one thing that we ended up kind of being taught, not intentionally, but just soaked in, was that we get saved by the gospel and then we grow based on our own work. Is that we get saved by trusting in Jesus and then we grow as a Christian by our own work. And the truth is that, that that is not the truth. We get saved by the gospel and we grow by the gospel. We get saved by the work of Jesus and we grow by the work of Jesus. It is not any other way. Jason, I don't understand. Every way that we talk about growth here is centered around the gospel. We even say it in our vision statement that we want to make gospel-centered disciples of Jesus. What does that mean? That means that, that we want to see everything through the lens of the gospel and take everything and filter it through the filter of the gospel and understand that the gospel is the thing. How do we grow? How do I find the ability to forgive someone who has wronged me deeply? You look at Jesus who suffered for our sins that he never committed. Uh, if I tell my kids to go clean something up that they didn't make the mess of, there's, it's like World War III in our house. The Son of God goes to a cross on our behalf to forgive our sins. All of them. How do I forgive when I don't want to forgive when there's nothing in me that wants to forgive you look back at the gospel because you've been forgiven more than than you're ever going to have to forgive in anyone else that's, a, that's good news you should be happy about that you've been forgiven more than you're ever going to have to forgive in anyone else How do, I, how do I walk in this world like that? You center yourself on the gospel. That is the way that you grow. Now, you find it in scripture. Like, th this isn't absent. It's all throughout the Bible. It talks over and over again about, about uh, whenever Paul's talking to a new church or whenever Peter's talking to someone, they're always bringing all these Christians who have trusted Jesus back to the gospel. Remember the gospel. Remember the gospel. That's the way we grow. It puts us in this posture of humility. It makes us realize that we are broken people and that we are always broken people, but that there is a God who initiated salvation for us in the face of Jesus. Let me give you the definition. Here's the way we define gospel. The gospel is the true story of how God restores broken humanity to himself by the work of Jesus. The gospel is the true story of how God restores broken humanity to himself by the work of Jesus. What happens when we sin is we are separated from God. What happens through Jesus is a bridge is built to bring us back. And your brokenness, your sin that destroys and devastates you, is dissolved by the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm.